This was my McLaren 720S. And McLaren was right. It wasn't fixable because of this damage here. So I had to buy a whole new tub to fix it. And Richard Hammond doesn't think I can get this done by Christmas. Seriously, you think Christmas? Which is in three weeks. But today, I'm gonna drive it. Oh my God. Is engine very bad? We've already switched over the engine from the old tub, the wiring loom from the old tub, bolted on a brand new rear frame, and also converted the right-hand drive tub to a left-hand drive one by improvising a little bit. You would never know. You would never know. <laughs> and now I'm left with this. One almost complete McLaren. Quite clearly, there's still a lot to do. And uh, the exterior, I, I don't even know where to start on that. But the interior is still in pieces. So I've got to finish bolting all this back together. So I think that is first point of attack. Let's go. Now, one of the positives we can take from the accident is that it didn't really cause any damage to the interior of the car. So most of this should all bolt together and we should have all the parts to complete it. That's if we can remember where everything went. The trick when rebuilding the interior is to remember what part you took off first. That way you can do it in the same order. I'm just putting in the screen here and then the carbon surround with all the buttons behind it. After that, there's a final trim which sits on top of the dashboard and clips to the center console. Yes, center console, screen in. Next up is where the rear view mirror mounts. Now, because this was a right-hand drive tub, the rear view mirror is slightly different because the driver's seat's in a different position. So I've switched over the bracket to a left-hand drive bracket. Then I can put the roof lining in, the interior light, and the sun visors in afterwards. Then, in goes the carpet. A lot of people ask, why didn't I just keep the car right-hand drive because I'm in the UK? But because so many of the parts on the left-hand drive car, like the steering rack, the dashboard, and the center console weren't damaged, there wasn't much point buying new ones to make it right and drive. So hopefully that clears it up for you guys. One interior in. Interior is in, kind of, to an extent, no seats. I'm leaving the back out because I kind of feel like these seat belts may have a code on them and I may have to take them out because, well, you can see the airbag sensor on there. And we did have an airbag go in the door and the pyro fuse was gone, so potentially the seat belts could have gone. So I do not want to put any of that in to take it all back out. And now, Chris. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna do the suspension because I want to get this thing actually driving. Yeah, suspension, suspension first, then radiators. Here is all of the array of suspension. And here, is where we got a lot of the suspension from. Look at this for a parts place, a breaker's yard with a 720S here. We spent most of the day stripping this car for parts, which brings us back to the shop. This 1,700 pounds just for that. And that was second hand, brand new, second hand suspension made by Tenneco, 1,700 pound. And it's, well, we think it's bent. I think it's definitely is bent. But it's really complex, it's really expensive, and I will explain it all once we start fitting it. I'm gonna do one side, Chris is gonna do the other. Yeah, let's start bolting this thing together. First thing to go on is the lower wishbone. This is what pretty much holds the whole of the suspension. Once that's bolted to the rear frame, I've got this rear tie rod. This is adjustable to get the track on the rear wheels perfectly straight, so we'll have to get it aligned afterwards. Then, in goes the drive shaft. The drive shaft just pushes into the gearbox, and after that, we're ready for the top wishbone. This also bolts to the rear frame of the car with four bolts, and this has camber adjust on it. Once that's fitted, we can move on to the wheel hub. Not forgetting to put the wheel speed sensor in the new hub. The drive shaft will then slot into the wheel hub, and the bottom ball joint will slot into the lower wishbone. After that, the suspension strut and spring. This bolts to the top of the frame and then slots in the lower wishbone. With a little bit of difficulty, as you can see here. That's rough. It's that. going in though. 
Once that's in, we're onto the final stages. Bolting the tie rod to the wheel hub and then connecting the top ball joint to the wheel hub as well. This has a lot of adjustment on for camber, making the wheel tilt in or outwards. Again, we're just going to put it in its neutral position for now, but of course afterwards we're going to need a four wheel alignment. It is step by step starting to look a little bit more like a car now. Well, <laughs> to me at least, but there's a few small problems. So here's the right side of the suspension, which looks pretty good to be fair. It could do with a little cleanup, which we can get to, but the most expensive part is this strut and spring, and it's a little bit different on McLaren's to what it's usually like on normal cars. Here is the price of a second-hand suspension unit, 3000 800 pound yes it's off a 675 lt but it's all the same but they are really difficult to find i know i was going to have to replace one side because well that's the remaining of it but both sides not so much but now now I, now I know I need to replace both sides. This left-hand side suspension strut and spring, I don't know if you can see on camera, but let's go around the back here. You can see how much it's bowing when it's uh, sort of going up, which is just not good. That is definitely bent. And to make things worse, when I went to the breakers yard to get some parts, I picked up the suspension unit, the only side they had, which was on a non-damaged side, which was this one, and this cost me 1,700 pounds. And it looks like this one is quite difficult to tell on camera, but I think this one is also bent. They must just bend really easily. And all of this suspension has to be set up by McLaren themselves. But what exactly makes it so special? Here is my drawing that I did of the 720S suspension. <laughs> Let me try and explain it. Let's imagine this is the rear suspension. Now there's hydraulic fluid in both of the dampers. The bottom fluid of the left-hand side damper links up to the top of the fluid in the right-hand side damper and the fluid in up here links down here into the right-hand side damper. Let's say the McLaren goes around the left-hand corner. That means the wheel on the right-hand side is gonna be pushing up because it's fully loaded down. So all of the force will be going upwards through this damper here. So now all this fluid is high pressure. So it's gonna be pushing this fluid out through the top and in through the bottom. Now naturally, when you're going around the left-hand corner, this wheel's gonna to wanna to go up and this wheel is gonna to wanna to come down. The cars have the most grip when both wheels are planted on the floor. So all this high pressure fluid up here is gonna be pumped here keep this wheel nice and flat and level with the car. Now what McLaren have done to make it even cleverer than that is add these. These electrical things here, they're on every single damper and what these are are valves. Those electrical valves which are here, here, here and here control the flow of the fluid. So when you're in comfort mode, it will open the valve up, allowing more fluid to flow within the damper, creating a more softer ride. And when you're in sport mode, it will close the valve up, allowing minimum flow in the dampers, keeping it nice and stiff and flat when you're on the track. Pretty clever. Yes, it is pretty clever, but it makes it difficult for people like us who are trying to work on the car. Not only are the rear suspension linked together, but also the front suspension is linked to the rear by these huge lines which connect it from front to back, all to keep the car as level as possible. Now, the reason why I have to take it to McLaren to set up, because when I start putting all these lines on, I'm going to have to start filling up the whole system with fluid, which is done at the front of the car. But the thing is, you imagine I get any air in the system, then the suspension is not going to work as well. This high pressure is going to be trying to compress air which is going to be spongy, the suspension is not going to feel as good so effectively you need to bleed it and of course to bleed the system it's electronically done which requires a special McLaren tool. So I guess I need to carry on assembling this suspension whilst you guys can think about how good my drawing was. So now we've learned how the suspension works, we should be able to assemble it pretty easy. In goes the hydraulic line into the top of the left-hand side suspension. That then tees off to the bottom here, which connects it to the front of the suspension and goes round the back and connects to the bottom of the right-hand side suspension. Next up, the hydraulic line goes into the top of the right-hand side suspension, around the back and into the bottom of the left-hand side suspension. We can then put the bolts in to tighten this up because this is really high-pressured fluid. So we 
don't want any of these coming off. And that same hydraulic line on the right hand side will connect to the hydraulic line which runs from the front of the suspension to the back of the suspension. And after all this, they still use the old school anti-roll bar, which I need some drop links for. And this is actually made by iBack. And it also looks like they make the springs for the suspension as well. This is where it gets even more expensive if it wasn't already. £2,000 a rear brake disc. Had to buy two because mine were broken. Carbon discs are great. Unless you have to replace them, then they're not so great. On goes both rear carbon brake discs. The only car I've experienced with carbon brake discs was the GT3 in America, and it was absolutely unreal. The hotter the brakes got, the better they stopped. It's going to get a little tricky again. So on the McLaren, it has a rear brake caliper, but then it has a separate rear brake caliper for the handbrake, which is electronically controlled. Problem is with mine, the electronically controlled bit is uh, broken. On eBay, the only thing I can find is the actual rear caliper, not the handbrake mechanism. This part number on the top here is a McLaren part number. That's not going to be any help, but... If we look round, if you look round to this part number on here, this is the Bosch part number. Now I've Googled that part number, you can see that same handbrake is used on an Aston Martin Vantage, an Alfa Romeo, and a Maserati Ghibli. Issue is none of those are particularly cheap, so it might look like I'm gonna have to call McLaren for the handbrake mechanism. But if any of you guys know any different, let me know in the comment section below. But none of that is gonna stop us from driving it. We do still have rear brakes, just not handbrake. Now we're almost on the finishing touches to be able to get this car running and get it running up to temperature. One thing that's needed is of course the radiator. And that's what I'm fitting now. It mounts to the side of the car here, along with the aircon condenser as well. There's two hoses at the top of the radiator I've got to connect. And one big hose at the bottom. And after that, we're almost good to go. <laughs> it's a slightly different shade of black, but this is not the colour it's staying. £2,000 for this rear wing. Yeah, the wing was expensive, but these are a little bit different to your normal wing. They are chassis mounted. They actually bolt to the rear frame of the car. So they take a lot of force. And not only that, they're hydraulic controlled. I've first bolted the rear wing to the chassis and then I've bolted the rear crash bar to it because after that, I can start installing the hydraulic lines. There's two lines which connect into a little T-box here. I'm then installing the secondary air pumps, which I think are just used for emissions. Now you can see both lines come out of the gearbox, run down here into that little T-box I mentioned and go off right and left. One side goes to the right hand side of the wing, which I assume is a feed pipe and a return pipe. And then the other side goes to the left hand side of the wing. I don't know whether if there's some kind of sensor in the gearbox which senses how fast you're going. So then it sends hydraulic fluid up it. I have no idea. Wing is on. Check it out. Up. Down. I'm not sure exactly what fluid it uses. It comes out of the gearbox here, but I have no idea how that works or what that works. I guess we'll find out when we start driving it. I don't think we're going to take it to the speed that this goes up on though. And now it's kind of in the way. So I think we will have to take it off to put the exhaust on. Next up, fluids. Coolant first. I don't think we're going to have a big issue with filling the coolant up because the radiators aren't all the way at the front of the car. So I'm gonna vacuum fill it anyway. And we all know how vacuum filling goes. It, it, it hasn't gone well on the Ferrari, but let's, let's give it a go on this. Favorite kit. We don't need to explain how this works because we've explained it so many times, but air's going across there and it sucks it out there. We shouldn't have any leaks unless I've let a pipe off somewhere, but we're about to find out. But we weren't getting any vacuum at all. There's not an overflow. Which suggests a leak. I tested my gauge was working. Yeah. Yeah. And it was. Do I pour it in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could always put water in now. 
I put water in now because if it pours out, I haven't got coolant all over the floor then. We're pouring water in. It isn't ideal. If there's a leak, it's going to go on the floor. And I'll tell you what else isn't ideal. Imagine buying a car and not knowing it had been stripped apart or worked on as much as this. But there is a way of finding out, and that's through Car Vertical. No. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> now imagine if you checked out a car using Car Vertical and it had been in an accident. It would show an amber light for damage like this. It also show you if it's ever if it's got any outstanding finance on there, if it's ever been recorded stolen, or if it's ever been exported. It won't show you whether it's had any water leaks though. What do you reckon? Pipe not attached? Or? Yeah, it's definitely pipe not attached. Right. Yeah, that is not attached. Where, 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 that where? is just just sitting there. Do you see it? Oh yeah, then what this one? But another cool thing about car vertical is that it will actually show you the timeline of the car. Every time it's had an MOT check, a plate change, an ownership change. And if it was in an accident, it will show you actually when the damage occurred and what category the car is or what title it is if you're in America. <laughs> where, 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 is it, where is it meant to go? At least it's something easier at the minute. Oh. <laughs> so I'd accidentally left off a tiny pipe which you can see me connecting here. It's easily done. Hose clip on, hopefully the vacuum now vacuums. Another thing that you Car Vertical can do is if your car was auctioned off at a car crash auction website, it's likely that you'll see the photos of when it was auctioned off there. So you can see the exact damage. Put this car on screen now. Yeah! Here it goes. So, to check your car out, or a car that you're potentially about to buy, click the link in the description box below, use code MAP for discount on that check, and thank me later when you save money buying your next car. Oh. Oh no. It's leaking here. Somewhere's leaking. Leaking. Oh, the rad's damaged. I can hear it leaking. The rad's damaged here. Oh. I can hear it. I've seen that radiator when I got it and I thought, is that going to be damaged? This is the problem with second hand parts. Um, it seems there's a hole in the rad there. I mean this, you can get away with this, but the water travels down these veins, like the long pieces here and it looks like there's a hole there. We put pressure there for it and it's still leaking. This is not good, but as always, we conquer and accomplish. We're going back to the breakers yards, well I'm not, my dad is, to go and get some <laughs> brand new second hand parts. <laughs> so appropriate right now, you can get one of these hoodies or t-shirts with the link in the description. So my dad's gonna go get some brand new second hand parts, which should solve our issue with a lot of stuff as well. It's gonna pick up a lot of other broken things. I'm gonna ring McLaren to see if we, how much these suspension struts are because we've got two bent ones, which should get us moving and rolling but how much, you guess? Two and a half each. Three. Good afternoon, McLaren, Birmingham, Dawn speaking. Hello, I'm wondering if you could put me through to parts, please. Guys, and they're 1,545, 77 each, plus the V8 today. Okay, and uh, uh, you can get them in in two days, is it? Two working days. Two working days. Co available. Cheers, thank you. Cheers, bye. Bye, bye. 1,500 pound plus that each, but I have literally no choice. 3,000 pounds. Wait, hang on, I paid 1,700 pounds for a second hand one, which is bent. So that's actually a better deal. <laughs> Next up, whilst we wait for my dad to return from the scrapyard, we're going to be filling the gearbox fluid. Remember, we lost a lot of fluid because the gearbox cooler had a hole in it. I've undone the fill plug here. Then I start to pump in the gearbox fluid until it starts to pour out. Then we can put the plug back in. Hey. Hey. After that, my dad returned with the parts. And we can start fitting the brand new second hand radiator. Hopefully, this one doesn't have any holes in. Got to connect up all the hoses as before and the aircon lines. And then this shroud goes on the outside of the radiator. We're slowly getting there now. Next up, we're back to the vacuum filler. We're hoping this time it will hold a nice vacuum. And you can see it's building up now. Nice. 
No noises. Once it had held a vacuum, I could then connect up the coolant part to it and it's going to suck all the coolant in through the system and hopefully we won't get any air locks. And then we can just top up the last little bit by hand. Almost ready to start it and run it to temperature for the first time and see if it goes in gear. It's exciting. It's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> but on this side, which was the most perished side, there's loads of plugs which are broken. So plugs are broken here, plugs are broken here. Um, and wires are just coming out of nowhere there. And this type of stuff normally on a crash damaged car takes a long time to figure out where the wires went and then what order, like if you get a plug, what order they went into and everything like that is really hard to find. So to save us time, when we went to the scrapyard, we bought part of the wiring loom. It pretty much cost us the full wiring loom though because now they can't sell it. 750 pounds. And did you know, well, I didn't know. I thought McLaren and Mercedes had split. Well, look, check this out. The wiring, Mercedes logo on it. So all of this is a Mercedes, well, the wiring plugs. I don't think it's actually a wiring loom off a of Mercedes. The only one really we need to work at the minute is the fan so we can run it up to temperature. The rest we can deal with. Another thing we need to get it started first time, our best friend, the pyro fuse. And what do you know? Mercedes Benz. And what do you know, when it says Mercedes-Benz, don't buy it from McLaren because you'll get added McLaren tax. So, here's one I bought off eBay. Did it go that way? Nah. Did it go that way? Maybe. You through? <laughs> I'm in. Pyro fuse is on, so now the power from all this board here can go across the pyro fuse and down to the starter motor. I've marked on it red. Oh, look. See that little hole? Oh, I'll scrape that on there. It's in. Let me see. I'm in. JD. What does JD mean? Job done. Connection. We're just going to run it to temperature. And if it runs to temperature and it is good, wheels go on and we drive it out. And Richard Hammond. Hammond, we're coming for you. This was it. Time to see if it runs up to temperature and goes in gear. Ready? Oh. Okay. Why is it smoking? It started, but there was a lot of smoke. Maybe it has been cold though in here. Could be a lot of condensation. We had pretty much every warning light under the sun on the dashboard, but I think that was the least of our worries. We had to top up a bit more coolant now that it sucked it all through the system and some power steering fluid and wait for it to run to temperature. How fast that rev! I'm gonna put it into first gear. But it didn't work. It would not go into gear. No. And the drive button in the centre console just wasn't doing anything. Neither yeah, was the reverse button. Reverse? So I can't go anywhere. Nearly at running temp. Sounds nice, doesn't it? We don't we never knew whether the gearbox was good or not anyway. Yeah, because we never knew if it was shifted. We never yeah, we shifted. never knew whether it was shifted or not. The engine was running to temperature quite nicely and everything sounded good, but didn't look good. Why is it doing that? It, it don't like starting either. Won't either, will it? Very bad. <laughs> Do it again. Oh. oh no. That's not good. It's smoking well, bro. Oh no. Oh no. 
Is engine very bad? Is the inside of the exhaust supposed to be wet? It really wasn't looking good. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Did we just blow up a McLaren 720S engine? We didn't blow the engine up doing that, what you just did. What was all the smoke coming out? Yeah, surely I didn't do that. <laughs> all right, yeah. <laughs> Have you put a coolant pipe straight into the exhaust? <laughs> the charge cooler, well, we're hoping, best case, it could be the charge cooler because that's on top of the engine and we can take it. A anything else is it, like, we've got to replace the engine. Remember the charge cooler has coolant running through it all to cool the air before it goes into the engine. If this was leaking any coolant, then it could be sucking it directly into the engine, causing all that smoke. But the pipe was bone dry. No. Oh, that's really dry. <laughs> so could the problem be the head gasket. My engine's very bad. <laughs> I don't know if you, did you capture that? The, the oil cap blew off when we started I don't it. I think I did now. So the oil cap blew off and it did blow off in the last video as well. If the head gasket's blowing it and it's blowing exhaust fumes into the oil system, then it would blow the oil cap off. It's a thing, isn't it? But the oil cap doesn't hold on very well, yes. Oh my god, have we got to take this engine out? Put this in your coolant tank. You then pour a bit of this fluid in there, which will sit in this reservoir here. And if it detects any exhaust gases going in, then the blue fluid will turn yellow, which means engine very bad. So in goes the tester. Okay, that... We're hoping this stays yeah. blue. If that goes any other colour but blue. <laughs> Blue's our favourite colour at the minute. It started first time though. It's gonna have no oil in it now, yeah. That's all. Did we pass? It seems okay. That's good news. That's not good news. <laughs> the head must have gone. Look at that. Well, at the start of this video, I said I was going to drive it. I lied. <laughs> we blew it up instead. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching this video. If you've enjoyed it as much as I have, please click the subscribe button, the thumbs up button. Um, I don't know if it's going to be ready in time for Christmas. See you in the next video. Peace out. I know the radiator was £1,500. Daylight robbery, pants down. <laughs> <laughs> like a truck